Hello, I'm Mike Petrilli of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute here with Mike McShane of the American Enterprise Institute. We are a fern between two mics. We are. Welcome back to the show, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me again. Our, our occasional show. I think this is our third time. Yeah. Uh, kicking this, uh, some ideas around. We've done what? We've done Common Core. Yeah. What else did we do? I don't know what the other one was. <laughs> we did <done> something <laughs> we did else. Two, we can't I think. even remember. Yeah, I don't even remember. I don't know. <laughs> well, we are here today to talk about the <laughs> Elementary and Secondary Education Act, otherwise known as No Child Left Behind and CLB, ESEA, however you like to hear it. Uh, exciting day in Washington today because there was a big hearing yeah. about ESEA this morning in the Senate. And I think most people think there's actually a chance that Congress could move a bill forward, certainly further than we've seen in over 12 years. So much excitement among the policy wonk crowd. We're going to try to talk about that hearing a little bit today. We'll talk about quick takeaways about the hearing. We'll talk about some of the major issues that are at play, uh, see where you land on some of these and, and push back on some stuff. Uh, let's start with this, Mike. Uh, the hearing this morning, Senator Lamar Alexander, now the chairman of the Senate Health Committee, any quick takeaways? What, what should people know about that hearing? Any surprises? What does it mean for this process going yeah, forward? One thing that I, I thought was, was really interesting about the hearing was just uh, the level and quality of questions that many of the senators posed to the panelists. I think Because you, what, are, you think that senators are a bunch of big idiots? Is that what uh, you're saying? I don't change? necessarily think that. I think that sometimes they are prone to soliloquies and some political theater, but I know some across the political spectrum. So I think Senator Warren asked some really dynamite questions. Senator Collins asked some really dynamite questions. So um, I, I was really impressed by the level to which clearly these folks, I mean, you have the people that have been involved in education for a long time, Patty Murray, yep. Michael Bennett, yep. Lamar Alexander. So it's not surprising that those folks really engaged. But, you know, it seemed like these these people were really digging into the issues, which, which uh I like. I mean, that was, that was great. Right? That's true. They, they, and, and very well informed, both the members. I think their staff did a very good job. Uh, and, and smart. I mean, you're right. I mean, the, Elizabeth Warren with this great line about saying, well, look, if, if we're not going to hold states and schools accountable, then why have this federal spending to begin with? Let's just let the states raise their own taxes yeah. for education, totally. which is, in a way, a classic libertarian argument. Exactly. Right. That wondering. is the principle of libertarian you, position. Would that take. extend to some other programs yeah. that she supports? Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm she not just sure. being a troublemaker, I yeah. think, on that That's one. That's all right. I, I did notice uh, Senator Whitehouse uh, a li li a few, got a few digs in on us education reform crowd. Yeah. That's he, true. As you see, he said, you know, there's two types of uh, people involved in education I have found. And there's you know, he went out the, <laughs> these, you know, consultants and researchers and, you know, you know blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then there's the real educators yeah. in the classroom. <laughs> ah, yeah, but but that's, that's all good. You know, as, as Politics K-12 reported at Education Week, uh, overwhelmingly the witnesses were arguing in favor of keeping annual testing. And the members seem to say, look, they, that, that, that No Child Left Behind was well-intentioned and that, yes, it has caused some unintended consequences. We need to address those consequences. But I didn't hear any of the members say, this has been a horrible law. We need to blow it up. Yeah. This is terrible. I mean, it really seemed like it was a debate between the 45-yard lines yeah. uh, rather than something for, for a very ideologically diverse committee. Sure. As Lamar Alexander, no, totally. the most diverse committee in the Senate, uh, you, I used to get the impression that they were way far apart on these issues. Yeah. No, I mean, that was the same. Obviously, the, it was interesting that the two teachers who were asked yeah. to testify were the two that were the most strident against um, some of the standardized testing that's associated with that. I, mean, I don't think that's an entirely surprising finding, yeah. but, but it, I, I agree that it appeared by the time it was done, at least amongst the, the members and the majority of the yeah. folks that were there, um, the idea of having annual testing. Yeah. is something that they want to support. Although, I'm like, really? Like Senator Murray's staff, they couldn't find at least one teacher who likes standardized testing? Really? There's like three or four million teachers? Not That's one? That's true. You could probably find Next a teacher time, that maybe. supports almost anything with 3.4 million to choose from. Hey, yeah. by the way, we want you to get into this conversation. Our hashtag is fern 2 mics spelled out to T-W-L. Yeah. fern 2 mics Hashtag we will be following along here as well, and we'll start to get your questions a little bit later on. All right, so let, let's talk about the issues. These debates in Washington on education, they always play out on two levels. There's the substance of, you know, what does smart testing policy look like, for example. And then there's the question of the federal role. Yes. Right? I mean, we may have an agreement on what the best policy is, but then there's a big debate on whether Washington should mandate that policy. Yes. Or not. All right. So let's leave the federal piece uh, till a little bit later. On the policy itself, I mean, what, what is the basic argument for testing? I mean, how do we get to this point? where we have all this testing in our schools. I mean, from your perspective, is there a strong case for 
testing or sure. annual testing? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, it depends, right? So, so the, the common justification that I hear for standardized testing is always usually some version of the same sentence, which is, we need to know how our kids are doing. Um, what's interesting about that is that that pronoun that starts it is not always unpacked, right? Because that we is a lot of different people, right? So it's policymakers, it's educators, it's researchers, it's a lot of different people. Parents. I think it's parents, community members, stakeholders, all these folks. Um, I think within the context that we're talking about now, we're mostly talking about federal policymakers, state policymakers, there's a need to understand every year how much kids are learning, how well they're learning. Are they hitting the standards? Are fourth graders where we think fourth graders should be during the course of this year? Did they learn approximately a year's worth of material? So it's important to take periodic measurements to make sure that students are where they need to be. Right. And, and you can make the case that parents do value this information. You right. know, the folks at great schools will point out that about half of all parents in any given year will go to the greatschools.org website, and they are looking for school ratings, which are based on these test scores, right? So they value this information. Sure. Uh, and they, they see it for their own schools or for nearby schools. We like lists, we like comparisons, we like to know, uh, and we are used to having that in a lot of areas of our life. And the worry is if these standardized tests went away, it would be hard to compare schools. Surely schools would continue to have some kind of standardized test that would tell you as a parent how your kid's doing. And they had those standardized tests, the Iowa Basic and the Stanford 9 and all of those going way back before we had these accountability tests. But if you want to be able to compare schools and see how the system is doing, then you need this kind of information. Yeah. All right. Now, in your opinion, is it true that today, and, and again, as a former teacher, not yeah. so long out of the classroom. Not so long. Uh, is it your impression that we are overdoing it, that there is too much testing going on in our schools today? Yeah. I do think so. Now, and now it's difficult to answer on a nationwide basis because obviously some in the 14,000 school districts that we have in, in the 100,000 schools, people are taking uh, vastly different decisions. But it seems to me, um, again, an end of one more type experience, that in many cases tests are being stacked upon different tests. So a lot of people are perhaps to blame for it. But I do think that there is way more testing than is necessary in schools right. today. But, but let's get specific. So a report came out of Ohio last week. Yeah. The Ohio Department of Education asked school districts to tell them about how much time these tests are being used. Not tests that teachers write, right? But, but anything that the district gives, a standardized test, or that the state gives, or the federally required. And the answer was, depending on the grade level, it's between 1% and 3% of instructional hours being spent uh, on these tests, and then another small amount of time spent preparing for the tests. So, you know, a lot of people, a lot of reformers have looked at that and said, yeah, that, that seems like pretty reasonable considering all the information we get. I mean, I've had a friend of mine who's, who's another parent. He says, hey, let me tell you, my kids are watching movies in the classroom sure. for much longer than 1% to 3%, right? I mean, if I could get that time back when, yeah. when the teacher's popping in a DVD. Look, look, look I'm with you on that one. And, and I think that if it, if it is around that, you know, 1%, so we're talking maybe, so what, if there's 180 school days, we're talking yeah. between like a day or two of testing. But remember, like, again, there's variation across states. And some states choose to, when they're giving their tests, you know, you have the kids take the tests in the morning and then they take the afternoon off and they sort of yeah. like relax to get ready for these tests in the weeks beforehand things that are maybe we would code as test prep or maybe that we wouldn't. So I think, you know, I think there's a lot of room in those numbers when we actually talk about the, the amount of instructional time, not to mention the fact in many benchmark tests or others, particularly the higher the stakes that they are, yep. many of them are given before the end of the school year. So there could be a couple weeks of school after those yep. tests are done. And again, depending from state to state and school to school, yep. a lot of folks it, can, it can, can shut lot. down four weeks early. And, and to be clear, I mean, I, I do generally buy the argument that there are places where there's too many tests and that we have piled on, you know, and it's, it is, it's the no child left behind tests. Those take up, you know, a big chunk of it. This study in Ohio found those certainly are a part of it. Uh, it is other state tests and other subjects. And look, some of us have encouraged that. We've said, hey, if you don't test in social studies, for example, then schools might feel like they're, they're, they can slack off on social studies or, or shrink the amount of time spent on that. There's all these, uh, these end of course exams that are yeah. being given at the high school level. Again, many of us have argued over time that's the way to ensure quality or you know, to make sure kids are actually graduating high school knowing something that, that will help them as they go on in life. So we have, been, uh, you know, we have been encouraging this and I think it's fair to say that we have to be willing to acknowledge 
that there are trade-offs and that yeah, we may have gone exactly, too far, right? Exactly. I mean, in Texas, there was a big debate last year about, you know, they are going to have 15 exit exams kids had to pass in high school. And the parents said, what? The, this is way too many. And it probably was too many. Yeah. But you know what's really driving this recently, I think? Teacher evaluations? Teacher evaluations, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, that's another thing this Ohio report found was that something like a quarter of all the testing now is because of these student uh, learning objectives. Sure. What the heck is that? So, I mean, that's most state um, teacher evaluation systems are a combination of different tests. So it could be performance on the state test uh, based on observations as well, as well as either district or state or sometimes I think even down to the school created student yep. learning objectives that teachers uh, performance are measured against. Yeah. And, and the trick was, I mean, here's, here's what happens, right? Federal government, well, Arne Duncan dreams up this mandate that you have to adopt yeah. teacher evaluation systems if you want to get a waiver from ESCA. Totally illegal in my view, unconstitutional. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, the states say, all right, we're, we got us over a barrel because we are desperate to move yeah. past the old ESEA accountability system. We'll do it. States, some states like Ohio, like Florida, they look at this and they say, well, here's the challenge. We only have value-added data for maybe 20, 30% of our teachers, yeah. the ones who teach reading and math in grades three through eight, right? So either we're not going to have student achievement data to look at for all the other teachers, or we're going to have to create new tests yeah. in history, gym, gym, class, art, music, on and on and on, in order to get those data. Well, in my opinion, there's an obvious choice here. You say, hey, for those other teachers, we just can't use student achievement data. They took the other path, yeah. which was to create all these new tests. And that has led to a huge new burden around testing. Now, to their credit, the, the state superintendent in, in Ohio in this report last week, he said, you know what? Outside of core subjects, we should get rid of those student learning objectives. That has led to way too much testing, and it's a problem. And to his credit, that is a way to fix this, this issue. Sure. Now, all right. So, so now back to the federal piece. Right. All right. So, so thinking about all of the pros and the cons, the overtesting, what should Congress do. Uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure now for people to say, let's, let's move away from annual testing. Let's reduce the federal footprint on testing. What's your, what's your take on that? I mean, my take on it is I, I have less of a problem with testing that is used to provide information as opposed to testing that is then plugged into accountability or teacher evaluation systems and others. So I'm all for using these tests to provide information about how schools are doing um, for taxpayers, for parents, et cetera. But uh, when it comes to all of the other stuff that gets associated with them, and I tend to think that it's a lot of that other stuff that adds the interim assessments and others because yep. schools want to know, are our kids going to pass a test at the end of the year? Okay, well, we need to give it after the first quarter or after the second quarter to make sure that we're on path. Otherwise, we won't necessarily hit these benchmarks. I'm okay with backing away from some of that and saying we will get that information at the end of every year. We'll be able to do stuff like um, have value added uh, between years, all of that good information that's there, but but back away on on the accountability. So that, on that's it. interesting. So you think if there's less of, a pr of the pressure from accountability, that people will back away from those benchmark exams. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope that's true. I mean, now, on the other hand, let, let's acknowledge, though, there is some research from some of the no excuses charter schools and others that actually those benchmark exams can help kids learn more, especially low-performing kids. Sure. I mean, there is an argument that instructionally checking in on kids every six weeks does help teachers in some schools with some methodologies and whatever. Yeah, look, I'm not opposed to if schools want to do it on their own volition and yeah. say this is the best way for our kids that meets their needs. Like that's fine. I mean, that's this is what's funny. You you sort of hinted at this earlier when we talk about the sort of conservative intuition when it comes to these things. Like mm -hmm. I actually don't have a problem with interim assessments if teachers or schools want to use them. Yeah. I have a problem when the federal government says all of you have to do this, right? right? Well, well, now, to be clear, the feds have not mandated those interim No, no, totally, totally. But that's... what the feds, what you're saying is the feds have created this environment, and in some ways an environment of fear, and you've got some schools out there freaking out, yeah. and so, uh, or school districts freaking out. This happens especially in these big urban districts, and so the way they handle this is they say, we're going to have these benchmark exists, you know, and the testing companies come in and say, hey, we'll test your kids, and we'll make sure they're unpacked. Yeah. There won't be any surprises when you take that state test, yeah, exactly. because you're going to know exactly whether kids are on track or not. 
Uh, and, and so then that creates this situation where every time you're turning around, the kid's taking a standardized test. And then think of the burden on teachers to then have to analyze that data and understand all of that sort of stuff. Again, it's different when it is from the bottom up and it's teachers in school saying, hey, this is we're going to work this into our instruction because it's essential to what we're doing, as opposed to when it's top down and teachers say, well, we, we got to do this yeah. and, and, and you, and you all right, flounder. But, but, all right, but, let me, but let's figure out where you're coming from here because then isn't that also an argument for just saying, so just get rid of the federal testing requirements entirely. I mean, there were teachers at the hearing today from New York City. They both were certainly uh, talked about all kinds of horror stories of feeling that they had to teach to the test and spend months prepping their kids and, you know, that it was, was not helping them be the best teachers they could be. Why, what is the justification then uh, for the federal testing? I mean, if, if your point is good tests are those that the schools want to use, that teachers want to use, you know, why have any of these external tests from the state or federal level? Well, because there are other stakeholders that need information about how schools are doing. Okay. All right. You know, like that's yeah. that's that's why. So it's so it's a balance. So you don't want to go overboard. Yeah. But you don't want to go. So there's a thing. So I'm not someone that necessarily says that we need to go to grade span testing or we need to get rid of testing all the way. It's we need to think about every test that we give or that we ask schools to give. Yeah. What is the purpose of this test? Right. Who is it serving? What information we're trying to glean? Because again, the type of test that a teacher needs to give to know where their student is is different than the type of test perhaps a principal or a superintendent wants to give to understand how their teaching staff is doing, but, but, which is different than yeah. all these other things. You know I know, but I mean? then that leads to you have all these tests, right? Possibly. Well, right, but again, that's... but if we narrow the scope of those rather than trying to have all of these things do too much, it may right. be... I just feel like, again, without the sort of accountability and all the stuff that gets tied up in it, yep. each one is much cleaner, is much clearer mandate of what it's supposed to do. Now, annual testing, uh, it seemed like most of the witnesses today were making a strong case for annual testing. Marty West sure. from Harvard, former staffer to Senator Lamar Alexander, yeah. so that was interesting. Uh, and a colleague of mine at, at Education Next, former uh, advisor on the Romney campaign. I mean, and he was making the case, as have, he's done this at Brookings with other colleagues there, that the annual testing has given us this incredibly important growth information. Yeah. That information is now used to drive most of the accountability systems in the country, especially ones that use the Colorado growth model and other growth models. It is used for research, right? We all, I mean, us wonks, we love it. We think a life without annual testing means life without value added and growth data. Yeah. And then what? You go back to measuring schools based on proficiency rates. That's a terrible option because yeah. growth can actually dif differentiate between schools that are high poverty but helping kids make progress in schools that are high poverty and brain dead. Yeah. You go back to proficiency rates, basically all the high poverty schools are going to look bad. Yeah. yeah, totally. So, but the federalism argument could be, hey, if states want to do annual testing and they are convinced that there's value in it, fight that out at the state level. Why mandate it at the federal level? Where, where do you come down on that? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that... Um for a long time, it's been understood, at least you know, the way sort of conservatives look at the Constitution and others, that, that uh, establishing standard weights and measures or dis collecting and disseminating basic information has always been respected as p a role that the federal government can play. I mean, think you know, all the way back to things like the census and others. So I think that fits into this tradition so that it's the, the federal government can play a role in collecting, disseminating information. Now, again, acting on that, intervening in local communities is a different thing, but I don't, I feel that it's perfectly reasonable and constitutional for the federal government to collect and disseminate information. All right. Now, uh, at the end of the hearing, it was starting to be clear. Uh, you could see Senator Alexander thinking through this, and he asked a couple questions to witnesses saying, okay, well, maybe what I'm hearing today is that it's not the testing that's the problem, it's the accountability, yeah. right? And, and that maybe this is the way through this pathway. You say, okay, we'll keep the annual testing, yeah. but at the federal level, we're going to remove the stakes. Yeah. You know, that, which could both mean, well, first of all, we're going to be less prescriptive about how schools come up with, or how states come up with their school rating systems, yes. their A to F systems or whatever. Sure. We're not going to be as prescriptive. We're not going to have adequate yearly progress or you have to have these kinds of goals or here's how, what percentage it has to count for which groups. We're going to let states more or less figure that out. Uh, and we're not going to require specific interventions for low performing schools, right? Now, some of our friends in the reform movement on the left have been arguing out there, Jonah Edelman, 
piece. Had a piece. We both responded to it. That you know, <laughs> yours backing, got a little bit more, uh, that, a little more fire and mind. Talk but, about that. Yeah. That, that. That backing away from accountability uh, in federal. This this was akin to going back to the 1950s states' yeah. rights arguments. Yeah. I mean, he, he <laughs> I thought implicitly was saying that if you want to give up on federal accountability, that's kind of like making the segregationist case for yeah. states' rights. But way back then. I didn't agree with that. Uh, Rick Hess and I wrote a piece that disagreed with that. Yeah, yeah it got a little bit of attention. Yeah, uh, yeah we would talk about that. So, so, these, so, so like, I mean, is this? I mean, is, is this? We, we, if we turn the page on accountability, we're, we're giving up on poor and minority kids. I mean, I just think that that's it. Jonah's piece is emblematic of this broader way of thinking. It's like just this, and, and and look, I think Jonah's an awesome dude, and he does stand for children does awesome stuff. So yeah. so this is I don't Point mean taken. for it to be to be to a personal against Jonah, him, but, we love but you. just yep. this, using this as an example of a broader scope. I mean, it's just this incredible confidence in a particular sort of suite of policies implemented at a particular level of government to do. I mean, in his piece, he said something like, "If we get rid of this, students who would be in college will be in prison." Right or and worse. Yeah, or worse, which I'm not exactly sure what worse They're is. They're going to die. Yeah, I guess they could be dead. Right. Um, but, but, but I mean, so this, what I'm saying is that there's, I, I think, and in my response to the arguments like this, I think that there is clear evidence that no child left behind specifically. So, you know, there have been studies of accountability. Been studies, yep. No child left behind uh, specifically has had a positive, a small but meaningful positive effect for students in mathematics, yep. right? That's what, to me, careful analysis, Tom D and Brian Jacob, Jake Victoria, Thomas, all these people that have done it. I think that is true. Yep. But you said a very important word earlier that we always have to talk about, which is trade-offs. Yep. Like, yes, we have experienced these things. That is good, and especially when education intervention so often we see no, uh, you know, we see no net effect of it. To see a net effect on a scale that large is yep. a great thing. But again, there have been trade-offs. So the question is, can we take, learn lessons from this, mm -hmm. take what we think ha does the most good at the right level of government, and then try and move around other things to the people who are better positioned yep. to meet the needs of kids. So, but let's go further. At the state level then, would your argument be that the states should do something about failing schools? Sure. That they should intervene in them, they should shut them down, they should turn them into charters, they should do something? Sure. Are you still wedded to that, that model of standards-based reform that there needs to be some kind of stick at the end of this? Look, I'm not necessarily, uh, I think states could have some latitude. I mean, I think they do need to develop plans to intervene in low-performing schools and low-performing school districts and understand all of that sort of stuff. But again, I mean, I think the state is the appropriate level because it's in state constitutions that students have a right to an education, right? So if students are not getting an adequate education, that is the level to which they can appeal. Mm -hmm. So as a result, if you, you know, if you're in a state, if you're the governor of a state, your state enshrines particular rights to students, you have an obligation to make sure that those students' rights are met, mm -hmm. right? That, to me, is the level of government that should be making it happen. Now, again, I would hope that there is a relative diversity of different options. You know me. I'm a big school choice guy, right? I think a lot of this stuff, these very mechanistic accountability systems, teacher evaluation systems, matter a lot less the more choice that people have of where to send their children. A lot of this is a result of, we say, because you live in this area, you have to go to this school. Right. And because our Constitution says we have to ensure that you have a quality education or whatever language that they choose to use, we have to use these oftentimes very blunt instruments right. to determine whether it's working or not. The more we can empower people to make those decisions themselves, the less I feel yeah. we have to have these, these types of tools. Now, look, and, and I, I want to make a provocative point on this. I mean, okay. I am willing, not just the federal level, but at the state level, to give up on the top-down accountability in terms of saying the state should intervene in failing schools. Uh, and, and here's why. First of all, I don't think there's been much evidence that it has worked. Sure. Right? We don't know what to do with these schools. Uh, you know, Andy Smerick and others have been making the case for years that these various turnaround efforts, in most cases, haven't worked, right? It's with some exceptions. Uh, we, uh, you know, the, the act of closing down a school from the state level, very difficult to do. The politics sure. are terrible. But here's the strongest argument, I think, is that we don't have to because there is another mechanism for closing down those bad schools, and it is school choice. Yeah. I'm I mean, that you, what you see in most big cities today is that the charter school market share is now getting up into the you know, 20, 30, 40 percent. And when that happens, uh, the school district eventually has to close schools, right? Because uh, they now have had all these kids move out of district schools into charter schools. Uh, and the ones that tend to be under-enrolled 
are the bad schools, yeah. right? I mean, parents are voting with their feet. They tend to leave those bad schools. And so when the districts in, in a Chicago, in a Philadelphia, a Kansas City, uh, you know, all around the country have had to say, all right, we now need to do some, you know, close some schools. They tend to close the under-enrolled schools. And these are the schools that are on the lists as being the worst schools in sure. the city. So they are going away. That and, and, you know, Checker Finn here at Fordham has argued this for 15 years, that this is the reason that standards-based reform and school choice fit well together. Standards-based reform can be very good at, at setting expectations uh, and at identifying schools that are not getting the job done, but it has never had a really good answer for what to do with those schools. Uh, on the other hand, you know, school choice uh, you know, it needs the information that comes yeah. from standards-based reform. You need to inform parents. You know, an A to F system is great for parents if it's built well, if it's thoughtful. Uh, they need that information. You've got to have that from standards and from testing. But, but the good other part of school choice is it does give parents a real something this, to do with it and a mechanism to shut down those failing schools. And hey, if you if you do all the policies right on the charter side, smart policies, right? By the way, Jay Green, uh, that does not, you know, he Jay's been on this bent that, oh, us reformers think we're so much smarter than those other people, and that's why our regulations are going to be better than their regulations. I'm sorry, Jay, like, there I, is such I a mean, thing I, as thoughtful uh, I may be closer. Oversight. I may be closer to him than you, but we can right, say that we can for talk another about day. It. But another if you, if you get episode. policies yeah. right, uh, yeah. and you have a high-quality charter sector like you do in Boston, like you do in New York, uh, like you do in Tennessee, like you do in Rhode Island, uh, then you have a great, you have this great system where you have kids moving from failing schools to better schools, the failing schools closed. This is what we're after. Well, and to me, too, what I thought was so interesting is so some of the teachers that have voiced their concern, a lot of the constituent groups that have voiced their concern that don't like testing, right? They, 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 we want to get rid of the, these different tests. We want to do all this stuff. Right? Like, an, an answer to that uh, and I wrote this for, for Rick Hesbach. I called it like a Christmas truce in the Ed Reform Wars. Um, I feel when I see these people talk about we don't like standardized testing. We don't like these mechanistic accountability systems. Like, right, cool, that's great. Right. How about we develop this system where teachers are free to create the schools that they want to um, and they reflect the values of the local community, all of these great things that we want, and then we just let people choose between them. And then if we have a system like that, the need for these centralized accountability systems decreases so much more. And it seems to me that people from across the spectrum can actually get behind that view. Right. Right. But, now, Ann Heislip on Twitter, she's oh saying, uh, in my opinion, the longer it lasts, the clearer it is to me that annual testing debate is a smokescreen to get Dems to give on accountability. Uh, in other words, uh, this was a brilliant strategy from Lamar, Lamar Alexander. Yeah. Get everybody freaked out that he's going to get rid of annual testing so that we weren't spending all this time debating uh, AYP. Yeah. And whether uh, states had to, you know, have a measures of achievement gaps in their school rating system. I mean, is is, is she right? Is that fair? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's what I thought from the very beginning. I think, I, I think I'm quoted in some article somewhere saying, when I first saw that, I was like, wow, man, if we spend all of this time yeah. talking about grade span versus every year, all of this other stuff, which, by the way, I by and large support and want to have happen, like... People will that that won't be as as much of a lightning rod. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, but you know what? I, I look. I, but I will argue. I don't. I don't. I just. I've been explaining. I don't think the argument for prescription on accountability is very strong. I yeah. mean, it doesn't help that the federal government has made a lot of bad decisions on that too. Yeah. I mean, for years, the feds have kept the states from moving in promising directions. You know, first it was growth. You know, Margaret Spellings uh, tried to show some flexibility. Uh, you know, this was now 2005, 2006. But what she allowed around growth in those early years was not really growth. I yeah. mean, she basically said, well, you can use growth, but you've got to only if kids are on track to be proficient within three years. Well, does that make sense if you're talking about a middle school and the, you know, the kids come in at a second grade level? I mean, what, what you want to do with growth is be able to give credit to schools and to teachers whose kids are making significant pro progress over the course yeah. of the year. And the feds got in the way, right? Now, Arne Duncan has allowed uh, states to go further, but even there, there's some limitations to what they can do. You know, and, and some of the people out there are still obsessed, for example, with the idea of achievement gaps. By all means, these, the, the performance of disadvantaged kids should count in minority groups and all of that. But do we literally want to measure gaps? Well, that's not so smart because then you're in this position where you're like, well, what we're doing is rooting for the white kids and the Asian kids and the middle class kids to flatline, yeah. right? Or to do worse. That's a way to close Lots the gap. Lots of perverse ways right? to close gaps. Yes. So, you know, if, if the feds hadn't been so clumsy, 
about a lot of these decisions. Maybe you could, maybe you could agree with Jonah that, yes, the, the federal policymakers are not only care more about poor and minority kids, but they are particularly well-positioned and thoughtful and smart yeah. on these issues. Well, I'm sorry. The, the reality yeah. is, over the last several years, that has not been the case. Yeah. Now, one thing that I think should be noted that I think a couple people have brought up that, that is worth talking about, though, is as, as I understand it, in the sort of the, the choices in this draft bill, you know, where you can either have the grade span testing or you can have the every year testing the way it is now. I'm under the impression that uh, in the even in the take one test every year uh, section, that it may not include growth. Mm -hmm. Maybe that they only need to report levels. And someone on Twitter may correct me on that one. I apologize if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, I think that that might be a little bit. I mean, I think one thing that we do want again separated from accountability, but the reporting every year of both levels of achievement and growth. Yeah. Um, I think that that's something, I'm not sure if it's in the bill right now, I don't think that it is. I think that's something that could actually make it stronger. So again, not necessarily hold people to it, but have, that, have us be able to, to see that every year. All right, let's hear from you folks uh, out there watching. If you've got a particular question for Mike McShane or for me or for the Fern, uh, let us know. Just tweet us at hashtag fern to mics Appreciate uh, that you folks are following along. And I will take a moment to kind of peek down here and see if there's any other things that we want to uh, pick up. Here's uh, Allison Crean Davis. She says uh, that it's a false dichotomy to present testing for accountability as different than testing for information. Uh, what do you think? You, you think that does she have something onto that? That it's the same effect, that if you're putting this information out there, you're rating schools, you're in effect shaming the F schools or the D schools. How is that any different than, than what we're talking about? Then like forcing them to do supplemental education service and others. I mean, I think that that's a pretty serious difference in kind. Like, yeah. Yeah. So you just feel like that's reconstituting, so forcibly reconstituting yeah. someone's school versus printing their name in the newspaper are two different things. And, and, and let's be honest. I mean, there's at this point, there's not a lot of forcibly reconstituting of schools happening. Sure. Right. Sure. Considering I mean, once it after five or six years, you can, well, but there's lots of options to choose from. I, right. I mean, even under the schools improvement grant program, I mean, there's just not a lot of that heavy handed sure. stuff happening. Right. I sure. mean, uh, which is, again, why I'm willing to turn the page on accountability. I feel like, look, it, it played its role, but it, is, it has been played out now. You know? And in effect, you know, everybody knows that its, its bark was worse than its bite. Yeah. Right? I mean, now, I think in a few states that have moved to A to F, uh, that new amount of transparency, because it's understandable to parents, has led to new opportunities that maybe for a year or two that'll really bite. Yeah. You know, in other words, when the label was, you know, needs progress... And uh, the, the, you know, was the F grade and the A grade was progress in place. I mean, I mean they were these ridiculous labels yeah. that nobody knew what the heck they meant. Yeah. Well, now if your school gets an F, that's going to catch people's attention. Sure. All right. But, but you think that's still different from, uh, from inter, uh, intervening. Okay. Yes. Let's see. Uh, Dale Chu. Uh, hello, Dale. Wants to know about our read on Diane Ravitch's open letter to Salad Senator Alexander, which I think was basically the message was, listen to me. Senator Alexander, that was uh, there was a rule in his little plaid rule book yes. about listen to Diane Ravitch. I think that was the old Diane Ravitch. Uh, on yeah, there. no, but actually, so I, I, I do. I remember reading this now that you, you brought that up. One thing that I thought, again, maybe, you know, I'm the eternal optimist, but it, the, the tone where in many of these things can get really heated and nasty and others, there was a really kind of familial or collegial tone between the two. Now, obviously, she, she wanted to move, I think, away from standardized testing, at least minimally to grade span uh, testing. Yeah. Sure. But, but at least, you know... Look, I'm trying to find the bright side of it because it's something that I disagree with. But it was it was done in a way that says, look, I sh I trust you. I, I remember her writing, you know, I trust your intuitions. You've been doing this for a long time, and I learned a lot from you, and you learned a lot from me. Let's maybe come together yeah. on this. Which honestly, I wish that more education debates shaped up like that. Yeah, no, and, and it was interesting today. You know, the uh, 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 the chairman, Senator Alexander, he quoted Carol Burris at length. Yeah. Now, Carol Burris and I have had our disagreements on many issues, yeah. uh, but I thought what you know the, the part of the letter of hers that he quoted was was right. I mean, it was in many ways a conservative argument for federalism. You know, she said basically, you know, don't make these decisions at Washington yeah. that you end up boxing us in. At so the well, I've said level. there's there's room to agree yeah, with there, a lot of different uh, people on this, and and I think that that's you know people talk about the, oh you're going to have these Republicans teaming up with these far lefties on, well look uh, th there is a reason that they're uh, you know. You don't have to be a conservative to have concerns that the federal government could make bad decisions 
that are then very hard to undo. We are living with a law that is 13 years old now, right? And if you think that the next uh, law, the next version might be around for another 5, 10, 13 years, you want to make sure that it's done in a way that does not impede progress and impede good ideas. And, and you know, this is a piece on the testing. I mean, my own view is the best technology we have right now for measuring student growth are these annual tests. And it's going to get better with PARC and Smarter Balance and some of these other new tests coming onto the market. I am hopeful that they'll be even better. But, you know, that may not be the case three years from now. Somebody's going to come up with some smart idea about how to use more competency-based exams or, you know, something that, you know, some brilliant way to use something that looks more like a portfolio, but that can do it in a way that's valid and reliable. I mean, the point is, if new technology, new ideas, new innovations come up in the next couple of years, we want to make sure that states have some way of moving ahead. Yeah. So maybe the default needs to be the annual testing, but there's got to be some uh, provision for pilots or something uh, so that we don't get locked in, like we got locked into AYP for all yeah. those years. Yeah, I did get a tweet from Ann, uh, thanks so much, uh, confirmed uh, state tests may measure growth, but it's not required, and Ed would be barred from ever changing that. There so I, I, I think I uh, uh, oppose that idea. I think we should probably, in the information that we disseminate, growth should be something that's in there. All right, let's, let's talk, uh, McShane, as we wrap up here about where this goes next. Okay. Uh, again, I thought the tone today was was quite respectful and friendly at the committee hearing, uh, but it was interesting. You know, the president gave a State of the Union address last night. He did not seem to be in a particularly bipartisan mode. Oh. Uh, he gave. Now, uh, he said, "Like, <laughs> let's all work together." Except remember those times that yeah. I beat you guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. And then let me give a campaign speech yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, put forward proposals that yeah. have no <laughs> chance of going anywhere yeah. in this Congress and on education. Right. He could have talked about ESEA. He yeah. could have said, hey, there, here's an area. There's, we're, we all want to fix this law, and, and we're actually not that far apart. Uh, and here are some things I really care about. Here are my bright lines. Nope. Instead, he talked about free community college, which is not going to happen. He talked about you know, child care tax credits, which is not going to happen. Why did he miss this opportunity? I mean, is this just another sign that he is not actually interested in in working together with this Republican Congress? I don't know if it's so much as that he doesn't want to work with the Republican Congress, but I just think that it's lower on his list of priorities. K-12 education is lower on his list of priorities. Ah, it's than politics. It's stuff. politics, McShane. No, I mean, it's like, think about it. There are lots of more pressing concerns. There's lots of more stuff that if he's talking about these sort of middle out of uh, economics and all those things. And number one, so if you want to talk about the political angle, A, there's a lot more stuff that's way easier for him to hammer on Republicans for. So right. the, the equal pay stuff that he keeps doing, paid family leave, all of that sort of yep. stuff is half the room stands up and half the room doesn't. This one is sort of a split thing. So we want to take the political angle. You know, it's just a, a split in his caucus. So why not when you're given the State of the Union, when you're talking about this stuff, talk about the things where you have unanimity uh, on these well, issues. But I think generally... The, the why not is because, you know, you're the president. You care about governing. You actually want to get something done. Uh, you yeah, know, and, and so you, he's, but... you know, rather than talk about, I dare you to veto my plan to... I dare you to, you know, do nothing on free community college. I, I mean, I get your point. I just, you know, the, the tone, it was so striking that this morning, Lamar Alexander, here's this guy, you know, he's been in public life forever, for most of his life, governor, secretary of education, now senator. And, he, you know, he had such a respectful tone. He was respectful to his colleagues on the Democratic side. And he said, look, I want this to be a bipartisan process, and I want to produce a bill that can get the president's Signature, you yeah. know, and and the tone was so different uh, from what you heard. Uh, sorry, folks, if you can't hear me out there, uh, <laughs> that the tone was so different from what you heard from the president last night. But but what but what what's your take? I mean, do you think we're going to end up with a bill that the president vetoes? Do you think that's the most likely outcome? Here? No, I mean, I think that it, if we end up with a bill, particularly if it passes out of the House of Representatives, you know, I think I, I imagine the House of Representatives might be a stronger hurdle than I mean, think if there were lots of bills with the, the immigration bill and others that they were able to to come together on in the Senate and fell apart in the House. I don't know. Luckily, uh, tomorrow morning at AEI, John Klein is coming to talk so we can ask these very questions to him. I don't know where he where he stands on uh, those issues. But no, look, I, I think that there is a middle ground. I think that Patty Murray and Lamar Alexander are two, you know, veteran legislators, really deeply knowledgeable about this. You've got lots of other really good folks on that committee. I really do think if they come together on it, um, that they have the possibility for a bill that, that will go through and that will pass. And like I said, I ultimately think that it's just not 
a super high priority for President Obama. So of all of the things that he might want to take a stand on, he may not like everything that's in there, but I'd imagine that if it's able to pass through those big hurdles and get to his desk, I think he signs it. And and the hurdle in the House is what, what I'm guessing is you're not sure if the conservatives and the Tea Party folks in the House would vote for a bill that looked like Lamar Alexander's or, exactly. or that might move a little bit further to the left exactly. uh, to pick up Patty that's, Murray. That's, that's where I'm, I, I, I wonder. But really, you know, I, I mean, to them, I'd say, look, here's a bill that, you know, okay, keeps annual testing, but gets rid of almost every other federal mandate, makes it very clear that feds have nothing to do with Common Core. Yeah. You know? Look, but, I think and, it's and the, the information, old... by the way, that is provided is important to school choice. And, and we've got school choice groups out there like the Black Alliance for Educational Options saying we want annual testing. Uh, boy, it would be a big disappointment if they could not get on board with it. Well, look, and like I that. think it, if you're them, I mean, it's a big step in the direction that you want to go. It may not be everywhere yeah. that you want it to be, but compared to waivers and who knows what's, if yeah. the Democrats take back the Senate in 2016 and we don't know what happens in the presidency, I mean, this might be the best chance that they have to really accomplish some substantive policy goals that they have. It would be a shame if they squandered it. All right. Well said. We'll let you have the last word there, Mike. Oh, uh, right as on. It was such, it was, it was, it was brilliant. That's good. It wasn't, people have said so many mean things on Twitter, not during this, but this has really uh, evoked a lot of, a lot of strong feelings, which I guess is good in a vibrant democracy. But um, yes. thanks for having me. It's My always a pleasure. good time. All right. So, hey, tell your friends and family about uh, uh, Affirm Between Two Mics. This will be available for streaming almost immediately. And we've got to do this again. Maybe we'll take up some of the uh, school choice regulations. Yeah, for sure. Bit. That'd be All awesome. Right. Thanks again, Mike McShane of the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Mike Petrilli of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Thanks so much for tuning in.